Hello. Welcome to another episode of CXO Talk. And this is episode <laughs> this is episode 30. <laughs> I'd like to thank you for joining us. I'm Michael Kriegsman, and I'm here with my absolutely wonderful co-host, Mr. Vala Offshore. Vala? <laughs> Good, Vala, how are you? Thirty with not one, but two incredible CIOs. I know two very innovative CIOs who are going to tell us uh, a wonderful story. Uh, the present CIO of Accenture, Andrew Wilson, and the retiring CIO of Accenture, Frank Monderson. Good now, day, gentlemen. Good day, gentlemen. Thank you. I'd like to thank SAP as well for sponsoring this week's episode. We really, really do appreciate that. So, gentlemen, Frank uh, and Andrew, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourselves and your roles? Um, Andrew, since you're the present CIO, maybe we should start with you. Delighted to, and uh, thank you for the invite to join you today. Uh, I think your program is very innovative and interesting. I am the new CIO for Accenture, although I'm not new to Accenture. I've spent uh, the majority of my career in the technology and business process industry, and most recently I ran Accenture's infrastructure outsourcing practice, serving clients all over the world running mission-critical production systems. Uh, the biggest client of all for us is ourselves, and this challenge is uh, allowing me to pick up the baton from Frank, who will in a moment describe where he's been for the last 11 years as CIO. Uh, on an agenda of a digital transformation for an organization which is itself at the heart of technology transformation in the industry. So I'm delighted to be CIO. I'm delighted to join you today. Great. Thank you so much. And, and Frank, tell us a little bit about yourself and your Well, role. thank you, Michael, and thank you, Andrew. Um, I'm wrapping up 11 years as Accenture CIO. I joined Accenture in 1987. I spent the first chunk of my career serving our clients. And then in 02, I moved over to become the CIO of Accenture, and I've had a wonderful ride. We've done some really wonderful things with technology, and now I'm passing the baton to Andrew, and I couldn't be more thrilled about it. I think our technology is well positioned, but technology keeps moving, and it really is a race to keep, at front, keep in front. So handing the baton to Andrew means he'll be moving forward and over time replace everything I've done. And I'm actually quite excited about that because technology just keeps moving and I was at a, an event with uh, Andreessen Horowitz this week mm -hmm. and somebody asked the question what enterprise you know technology today is going to exist tomorrow actually I think the right answer is probably none of it it's pretty amazing how much things will change over time so I think, you Andrew I think the nature of what the enterprises technology is is actually changing as well 10, 15 years ago, it was all about data centers, networks, and everything behind the firewall. And we all know that that is now very different. But the actual range and extent of the technology which a CIO is now responsible for, or indirectly responsible for, because there's a lot of brokering out into cloud and into managed services, has changed the nature of the role significantly. So we look now at TV studios and social and collaboration media as as important as the traditional back office core systems, which I think used to typify the role, but I think less so and, and increasingly so today. Question to Frank. Uh, Accenture, one of the largest, cons the largest consulting firm uh, in, in the world, 275,000 employees, uh, considered a global Fortune 500 company, and you've been the CIO for 11 years. What does the role of the CIO encompass for such a you know, massive organization that's servicing clients around, around the globe? Well, it, it encompasses a lot. At the simplest level, it encompasses all our infrastructure, mm -hmm. network, you know, our hosting, data centers, all that stuff, and then all the applications to really allow the company to operate on a daily basis. So that, it, it, in a nutshell, is our technology. Then you break it into operations and investments. We try to bias as much effort on innovations as possible to drive ourselves forward into the future. But it's about transforming Accenture, transforming how we work, how we interact, and constantly moving the company forward into the future. So IT today, 
looks nothing like it did in 2011. In fact, most of that IT has been all replaced. And if you spin forward, I think under Andrew's leadership, it may actually happen faster in the next wave. So, so IT. So you're going uh, through this constant renewal of IT, and it sounds like your reference point is how can IT actually change important aspects of the business. Correct. Absolutely. And keep up with a very rapidly changing business. Accenture isn't a single homogenous entity. It itself has transformed. It enables high performance for its clients, but it, it needs to be very nimble. So. Ten years ago, it was predominantly uh, a client-based mobile workforce, but working in the same location as clients and working in the same location as each other with basic technology enablement, email, etc. Now we have global delivery networks. We have large client teams, multi-sourced from many different shared service entities all over the world. We operate in every time zone continuously, and so we do a lot more of our work through virtual enablement than through physically being together. But then on top of that, we have an increasingly mobile workforce that it needs increasingly sophisticated tools in field to do their job. And bringing all that together and the demand profile is very different from uh, the more classic world, if you like. Is mobility the mega trend that's most impacting the transformation, not just within Accenture, but your clients and the enterprise? For me, mobility is a mega trend, but an increasingly and equal one is a demand for mission critical always on for services which were not initially perceived to be that mission critical. It's easy to see why the back office finance system would be regarded as you know key. Sure. But now collaboration, which started as aim and basic instant messaging, is the way we all talk every day for voice, for video, and for virtual meeting enablement on quite a sophisticated scale and on huge scale as well. Now that has changed completely in the last three years. The adoption you know, breaks all records, goes through the roof. We are well over 100 million minutes of, of activity every month through something which has to be absolutely mission critical. And frankly, if there's any disruption to it, then it's far more impactful and immediately evident than if the finance system, for instance, has an hour-long outage. And so we've had to completely reimagine the nature of the frontline service interface to our clients, i.e. all the end users. And then you're right, you know, and by the way, they're on the move. So it's not a case of being in a nice quiet room in the studio. They want to access it through mobile tablets and through uh, smart devices as well. And they want to be able to collaborate with their clients through that, which then layers in security, which I would argue is a third mega trend that we have to deal with as well. Frank, you've been CIO for 11 years now, and for many CIOs, ask the question, how, how can we be relevant, how can IT be relevant to the business? But it sounds like, in your case, that issue of relevancy kind of goes away because you see, and I, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but it seems that you see yourself, you see IT as kind of integral with the business's transformation strategy. Is that a correct way for me to look at it? Well, it is a very good way to look at it. And I think the key part is to have a very engaging dialogue with the business. We have an IT steering committee composed of the COOs of the company, the people that run Accenture on every day, everyday basis. We spend a lot of time interacting with them and have over the years they're the governing body of IT, but they also guide us on what's best for Accenture. They are the voice at the senior level of what Accenture wants. They help us ferret through all the requests we have. But then we go down into the business and we work hand in hand with business people because ultimately IT is here to help Accenture operate better, whether it's in our back office function, in our collaboration, in working with clients. You know, we see the barriers between ourselves and our clients going down. We want more integration across the firewall. We want more integration for our people around the world. As Andy, Andrew put it, right, we show up at our clients. The people that show up at our clients can be anywhere in the world. Teams are often made of individuals from different parts of the world coming together both physically and virtually to serve a client. And those teams might be five people. Those teams might be 500 people. The technology is what brings it together, but we need to constantly be talking to 
our end users and getting feedback. In fact, we have a, a project underway right now where we're actually doing deep dive focus groups to get better information about exactly what the organization wants in different areas of our technology. What, what, do you have a sense what percentage of the 275,000 employees are mobile or virtual office telecommuters? Uh, I get a sense with this mobile mega trend social and collaboration and the fact that you know we live in an app economy that the notion of an office space may over time go away. Uh, how much of that is true within Accenture? Well, Accenture, there's, there's a diff couple of different parts to Accenture. I would say we have about 300 locations of our own okay. around the world. I would say roughly half the people are in our locations. The other half are somewhere else in the world. We know that our people show up every day at about 10,000 different locations. Wow. Those locations can be clients, home, airport, internet cafe. It can be anywhere. Wow. That is unbelievable. So you're supporting this infrastructure of 10,000 non-deterministic locations. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that makes for an interesting day. That's unbelievable. So, so tell us about, I mean, in terms of security and availability, uh, you know, how do you ensure that the user experience is the same when they're at a client's location or on the way to the desired space or even in the office? Uh, that, that, that's just fascinating. Uh, you would have to uh, have lots of checks and balances and monitoring and, and really the pulse of the network from 10,000 locations. Well, there are a couple of things we do. First off, it's architecting our solutions hmm. to be simple and accessible from anywhere. Right, so we're very much an IP, HTTPS architecture for everything. If you can get a network connection, our technology needs to be able to show up. We cannot control all the links over the network because oftentimes people are on the internet. But as the internet has gotten better, this has become a very viable solution for us. Um, and in fact, I was in a discussion with one of our large financial services clients this week. Interesting enough, it was over video with some of the people who were in person. Our CEO was actually in Paris. We were in uh, the Bay Area, all stitched together. And one of the members of the team that was presenting to the client from our labs group talked about how they work with a group in the Philippines and India and that they use some of our high definition video to talk to those teams from home in the evening. And the CEO of this financial services company was frustrated because he said, I can't get the video to work on my internal network. You've got it working on the internet internationally. How's that possible? Well, the technology is actually getting pretty good. We do a lot of work to try to enable that and educate our people on what's necessary for it to work. And then we watch the logs and work it. That's amazing. Yeah, it's pretty extraordinary. Uh, Let's go back to this topic of innovation and, and transformation. What exactly, we hear people talk about, we hear people use that phrase, IT innovation, IT transformation, business innovation, business transformation. At Accenture, with respect to IT and the relationship to the organization, what exactly does it mean? And where does the rubber meet the road in practice as opposed to just as you know, concepts or buzzwords. Andrew, you want to take a stab at that one? Well, in my prior role, uh, that was a question clients asked all the time. And I, I boiled it down to, uh, it's around ensuring that the technology you operate isn't a function of its past to derail its present. So uh, large scale networks are typically built up over a period of time. They can be a function of uh, rapid expansion. They can be a function of uh, acquisition and the technology is inevitably if not managed in a transformationalist way uh, going to fall behind the business appetite for communication collaboration simplification and clearly costs so there's always a combination of cost availability and uh, tell me what the right innovation is there's too much in this ecosystem too many new ideas too many swirling things how on earth do I select something which is going to be around long enough that I can get in place and I can integrate with the other components I need to integrate with. And that boiled down is the question most clients uh, have asked me. And so a pragmatic transformational agenda is something which brings simplification, remote operation, 
uh, low cost of operation, uh, standardization, and then an ability to augment it in a rapid way, but to regard it as something which is going to change completely in a more rapid refresh cycle than it would have done 10 years ago. So if it's your network, it's typically combining voice and data and video. Uh, it's got to have new security protocols. It's got to have a higher state of availability and resilience. It's got to be automatically always on and tested as such. Uh, features and, uh, and factors that, uh, if not designed in from the start, uh, are, typically, are difficult to add later. So an innovative agenda is how to bring about that more quickly and to um, deliver benefits in a business case, which the IT can then be run as a business, which is one of the things we want to do. Accenture's business is technology, and so to a certain extent, the CIO organization has to be preeminent as an example of that because our clients often want to see us doing it to ourselves in order to prove that we are a safe pair of hands to do it to them as well. And Michael, can I add a, one point to Andrews that I, that I think is important? So I also think as you go to the future, mm -hmm. you need to be very cognizant of getting rid of 100% of the past. That's what actually a lot of organizations trip, on, trip up on. They move to the new stuff, but they don't retire everything from the past. They retire most of it, but not all of it, and then they have this legacy of little problems that end up bopping up and, and getting in the way of things. So I, I often think about, you know, if you remember the old days of railroad North America, when they went into parts of the country, they'd lay the rail in, but since metal was valuable, they went after natural resources like lumber, they'd lay the rail in. When they cut down the trees they wanted, they'd actually come back up and pick up the rail. They'd remove the railroad. But I didn't have to do that. It'd be hard work, right? But getting rid of the last vestiges of old technology is really hard. It's incredibly valuable to do it. How do you do it? In an organization at the scale of Accenture, I mean, I can, I can see how, it, how a small company can do that, but how do you manage that at, at the scale at which you operate? Aggressive standardization and regular refresh cycles is actually not as hard as you would think. Yeah. You've, think got to, you've got to attack the problem the right way and think holistically, but one of the hallmarks of our IT is not only is it brand new, but it's the least expensive IT in our industry, which is a bit of an oxymoron, but you know what? That's what happens. The, the new technology is always cheaper than the old technology. You were going to add something, Andrew? Effective governance with your client base as well. And again, we practice what we set out to do with our external clients. So typically, large multinational. So scale is something we're used to. Uh, we see clients working in 100 operating countries. We're running business processes for them. We're running IT enablement under that. The way it, it works successfully when there's clear mandate from center to act and take action and to mandate standard, there's local enforcement of standard, and then there's automation and management and monitoring of standard. And we do all of those things, and that's vital from the security agenda, which we were touching on earlier. Um, but to allow sufficient flexibility, th there is a fine balance, and I'm finding it already as we roll out additional security arrangements with our organization. There's a fine balance between uh, encouraging the creativity and mobility and and freedom, which I think the modern generation has grown up with with IT. They have an expectation and an entitlement to this, at the same time as governing from an enterprise perspective, overall risk, security, et cetera. And, and that balance is something I think is going to get harder to deliver to a business that feels under pressure to demonstrate cloud and innovation and you know, the, the, the newest aspects of go-to-market. Uh, and so CIO has a very careful governance role to ensure we don't leap before we're ready, but then when we do leap, we leap aggressively in a long way. Staying along the same theme of going into the future and retiring the past, um, I, I believe it was earlier in the year, Atos, a company with nearly 100,000 employees, had said that by 2014 they were going to abandon email completely and use social collaboration technologies to communicate within their enterprise. Can you give an example, if you could fast forward maybe three to five years from now, or, or, or end of this decade, what are some of these technologies that you envision 
Is it email? Is it is it on-premise data center versus a SaaS cloud-based solution? What do you envision companies retiring uh, as they transform their business to a to a more innovative um, organization? I think business uh, the future businesses will use existing platforms differently but migrate through time. So email is an example. Hmm. Email uh, has been classically used and overused as a communication vehicle and it's become progressively less and less effective. Uh, push email of that nature uh, does not fit the way in which individuals now source data and collaborate. Right. So, so knowledge exchanges, social collaboration, uh, environments where individuals connect on ideas and threads uh, and follow each other becomes the way to now insert corporate communication and to land it more effectively in the minds of the users, and that's what we're doing. So I think so. I think email will be used less for a less wide range of activities, just as frankly the telephone has been. I mean, the right. telephones do not ring in offices now because social collaboration inter indicates who's in your call, who's available to call, and you call people when they're available. So voice messaging and things of that nature, I think, are also becoming a thing of the past as well. So well I, I would add specialized devices. I think the phone is a great example of a specialized device that we don't need anymore. I think you're going to see more and more of those things show up on individual, you know, your cell phone or your laptop. Software takes over the world. I think that's been pretty obvious for a long time. So a lot of specialized devices are going to go away. The phone's a great example, Andrew. And then I think at the other end of the spectrum, the expectation of what technology will offer. So Facebook and YouTube hmm. and Twitter, the, the, we're all very familiar with what capabilities those services offer. The enterprise needs the equivalent, but with, it, with, with additional security and containment. And uh, any application service or proposition that I take to the business that does not have those collaborative components uh, is going to fail. So as an example, I'll, I'll take the communication one a step further. We're no longer going to broadcast out long emails with, by the way, what's happening this week. We have a channel, which is a TV channel, and bite-sized chunks of media right. where we deliver focus messaging that people can configure and look at as a TV channel. And that's the way to get a message home to a workforce who will then draw on that content when they need it, where they need it, and through what mechanism they prefer to use it. And, as two well, of the and, and in fact, let me just build on that for a second, because some of the stuff we have, we kind of forget we have. Hmm. So for example, we have now two, soon to be three broadcast centers where we can plug together any number of locations around the world and also stream to the web at the same time. Right. So our CEO can get in there, speak to a small group, a large group. He can have an interactive audience. Other executives can use it. You can really be anywhere in the world to use that, and it streams out to the web. And I've talked to other CEOs, and they're kind of like, wow, why, why don't other companies have that? Wow. The technology's right there. Bringing bringing yet another dimension of always on, because now we're a TV channel and we're a TV content generator and broadcaster. And the expectations of video always working and the TV always being there are very high. Gentlemen, so, gentlemen what do you do? I'm sorry for interrupting. Uh, what do you do on the, the, the business side? Because you're, you're talking about the introduction of technology, again, across this very large organization. And so what are the cultural attributes and the changes that you have to drive to ensure adoption on the business side? Accenture is a very adoptive culture. It, its demographic is technologists that like technology. So we, we have that advantage. It can be an overdone advantage because we can have very rapid adoption, which is why we find ourselves demonstrating scale in the industry, which it's difficult to find other examples of. So we will often be leading edge in terms of scale, performance, and load, and proving these technologies at a scale perhaps beyond which they've been proven before. And that's definitely a dynamic. And I think um, we, have, we have a very adoptive leadership culture as well. So we're not just talking you know, simple internal little broadcasts. So we, we, we routinely work with 
with the industry analysts. We routinely work with clients. We introduce clients to our global capability, not by everybody getting on planes, but by literally providing a window into our locations in, in Asia Pacific particularly. And all of this is enabled on a backbone which we're both managing and then providing the content through. So uh, it requires, back to my theme earlier, you know, an always-on mentality, very much like a, you know, a, a TV network. I'd like, I'd like to uh, just invite people who are listening to submit questions. We're joined today by Andrew Wilson, who is the CIO of Accenture, and Frank Monderson, who is the retiring CIO. So if you're listening, this is just an extraordinary opportunity to ask these gentlemen questions. And I also want to very heartily thank SAP for sponsoring this episode. Uh, the question to Frank, um, you know, more and more you hear that potentially the, the chief executive in the enterprise that will um, uh, uh, champion this adoptive culture that you spoke about at Accenture is the chief digital officer, um, not necessarily the CIO or the CMO, but what appears to be a hybrid role of the two, whereby this individual is really focus on transforming the business on the mobile, social, cloud, big data, application economy, and overall user experience. Is there a CDO at Accenture? And if, 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 if not, is it the CIO's role to really champion this adoptive culture that, that you speak about? Well, first off, there is not a defined role as a chief digital officer. We believe every company has become, is already or becoming a digital company or digital business. So I think that's real. I would tell you that Pierre Nanturn, our CEO, does a lot to sponsor the adoption of some technologies, particularly video, desktop communications. Right? He's out there in front of blogs, social, etc. But but he's one person. He's our senior leader, but he's one person. Our group chief executives for our different industry groups do the same thing. Head of technology, same thing. So you can't get this wrapped up in one person. It's really the tone from the top that cascades down to their leadership, which cascades down to their leadership, which cascades down to their members. In fact, one thing we found that's actually quite interesting, at least was to us, is the gamification of adoption of technology. Wow. One thing we do, we have a group called our Global Global Leadership Council. It's the top 150 or so leaders of Accenture. When we get together with them, and we do this with other groups as well, we have all the stats on who's blogging and who's, you know, posting stuff and who many how many people, you know, how many link how much video minutes you're doing, whatever. We have stats and we put them up. And invariably everyone's curious on the leaderboard where they stand. They come over, they look at it, and they're like, wait a minute, there is no way I'm behind that person. And it becomes <laughs> like a competition. There's, you know, and it, and it, it actually, it's amazing how engaged they, they can't walk by the leaderboard. That's the awesome. doesn't have everybody's name on. They're like, well, wait a minute, they're ahead of me in audio, but am I ahead of them in video? Well, yeah, that, I must be, you know, and it's, it's actually quite interesting. We've taken to adding little ribbons and awards that go wow. on there. There are people pages. If you get over, you know, a thousand minutes of audio or video or two thousand or three thousand, you can see them when you look up people, and it's become kind of important. And that's beyond the 150. That's the 275,000. It's amazing how this happens, right? It builds on itself. So if you're t if you're expecting one person to get the job done, right, it ain't gonna happen. What an amazing! Uh, and by by the way, just Andrew's Andrew's a little competitive in this. He's uh, where are you standing there, Andrew? <laughs> I'm currently number three in the company. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I've just I've just overtaken number four, and I'm well ahead of Frank. Um, <laughs> just to make, just just in case anybody was wondering. <laughs> Well, I would have thought just by the number of monitors around you that you would have been in the top three. So, yeah. So how many? So, so Andrew, how many monitors do you have there? I have six monitors in my home uh, office. I use it for a combination of work, but I also have an interest in uh, broadcast technology and video editing, which stems back to my time in the UK uh, as a student when I worked on radio and in television. 
And um, one of the interesting things, and actually one of the things I like to think has helped me step up to be CIO, is that it's a convergence of broadcast technologies and IT technologies, which I think will be illustrative of success for the next uh, five or ten years. And it's another reason why I was very keen to um, step into Frank's shoes. Um, my friends do tease me on the number of monitors, but uh, uh, I, I enjoy them because, of course, there's three behind me, and I'm looking at three in front of me right now. <laughs> but you must have, as I mean, again, it's, it's amazing to me that a 270,000 employee, nearly $29 billion company, has such a great, open, transparent culture where you can gamify, exactly. you know, blogging and social collaboration. I mean, can you can you tell us, you know, when did when did you introduce gamification? And is it true that unless you have a very um, open, transparent, accountable culture, gamification could be, uh, you know, could be damaging to your business if it's not done right? Is that a fair statement? You need to be careful how you do it. Um, and we dipped our toe in the water. I want to say it's got to be two years ago, maybe a little bit more. I, I really, I, I, I'll defer. I just don't remember. Um, we've been doing it for a while. And we've kind of rolled it out in kind of little waves. We started it with a small group. We put the numbers up. We found out how much people kind of came over to see what it was about, then wanted to know about themselves. And we said, wait a minute. They're interested in this. And we kind of built on that. And we, we don't try to embarrass anybody, right? Th these are the numbers, right? It's, you know, we're not trying to make, it, make you know, and, and we try to focus on the, on the top end of the numbers. Right? If somebody asks where they stand, we'll show that, but the stuff we display is the high end. The, the addition has been really focused on what you've accomplished, not the lack of what you've done. Right? So we try to make it a positive thing, right? focus people on the future, focus on where we're going, um, and, it's, and it's worked out well. You know, these are funny things. It's, it, you've got to be, uh, you know, our culture is open to it. It works well. We, we have a very, yeah. go ahead. Here no, I'm sorry. I was going to say uh, we, we have a question from Twitter. Our friend Lauren Brussel, who is a reporter at CIO Magazine, asks, do you use gamification for employee training? That is a good question. I'm not sure I know the answer, Andrew. Do you know if it's, I know I'm trying to think if we use it with training or not. I think we do. I think there are some things where we try to get people to adopt stuff. I'm trying to remember the example. I, don't, I think it's form. I don't. I think we're in the formative days. I wouldn't say it's a major uh, theme of training. There's a lot of technology enablement of training. It's all done remotely. There are quizzes and one has to get a score and there's some competition. Element there, but I don't think that's true gamification in the way that Warren is looking for. Yeah, but um, there was some stuff we did on on the portal where you could identify leaders and you had time to do this. And I'm trying to remember if there was any. I thought there was a training class that had picked up on that. It, it, but Andrew's right. We're in the early days of ex exploring it over into training, but we have been pushing on this. Uh, actually, somebody pinged me. It's about three years. Cool. We we're using we're using modern technologies. I think to uh, embed almost higher order concepts than individual training topics. So we have something called the Accenture Way, which comes with certain iconography and including our greater than sign. And we've had to and wanted to embed that in the conscious DNA of the company. And so what we did is we ran a global photo competition where photographs can be submitted electronically clearly, and where we've encouraged creativity and innovation and got some beautiful artwork which we publish internally each year. Uh, and by the way, we communicate the Accenture way through this process. And so at the moment, I would say that form of competition and, and enjoyment is, uh, is being landed at a higher level than individual training courses. Yeah, Andrew, I'm getting pinged by some of our guys who are watching this. Give me examples where we've used it in training. So you and I probably need to get caught up, but we are <laughs> using right, so, uh, <laughs> so it. Like, what the... about this one and what about that one? I'm like, OK, guys. Geez, I've got three different IMs open here. <laughs> the folks on the ground are not going to let you uh, malign their but this training. This is the effort. new world. This is the new world. We're doing a live interview, right? We're stumbling around trying to remember where we've used it for training. Uh, we, our head of infrastructure, pinged me. One of our guys in high, uh, human performance, pinged me. One of our comms person, I, gee, 
I got all sorts. I got I got four or five different people. So, you so know, John, so Ursula, Vid, Kevin. So, so, it's, so it's clear that Frank, Frank and I need to visit Accenture Land <laughs> <laughs> and also play um, the X Factor equivalent of security as well. We have so a video have game. Run. Jeez, we're all over this. I'm getting the URL, the internal URL to go do it. <laughs> you you have just earned a ribbon for learning about uh, the training use within the company. Yeah, real life are... embarrassment. There we go. <laughs> no, but it's all so, good, right? We got the right information like that. That is the new world. Yeah, it's, illustra it's illustrative of a very flat open culture. Frank oh. and I are you know, surround. I've got the same windows around Frank. People feel an opportunity to reach out real time, simultaneously, and um, that increases the pace. It increases the pace of our business development work, of the client work we deliver every day, and at the way we can refresh ourselves. And um, yes, and it also means it challenges the leaders to wow. be on their game all the time as well. And I, and I think for organizations uh, who are, folks from organizations who are watching, who are you know, bound up in silos, silos between IT and marketing and other silos, for example, it shows how with the right culture and the right technology together, it can just, as you said, flatten the organization and, and break down those silos to enable what well, we see, real-time communication. We're seeing it here. That's amazing. Uh, Frank, Frank, Frank was describing our digital agenda earlier. I mean, to say that one organization owns our website would, would be patently ridiculous. Uh, we enable the website, you know, marketing will set some of the parameters, but that interlock around a business process and activity which frankly spans the firm is a good example of many. Uh, I believe that the CIO agenda is going to be richer in that in the future. The CIO will no longer be an order taker to say give me this functionality and deliver it to a cost and a budget in six months time. Mm. It will be to be directly there and present in a much more evolving real time world. Um, and uh, I, that's another reason why I think things are going to accelerate and change in the next few years. Yeah, exactly. And I, I, I would also add, just to build on a point here, when you think about the, the you said some organizations are not open to it. I don't know how they can't be. Right. Remember when you were in university and you got extra credit for class participation? The reason was it made for a better class. Right? right? Yeah, but I tell you, I some of the maybe I'm hanging out with the wrong crowd, but the stories that I hear inside some organizations are frightening. The boundaries that exist and the difficulty crossing those boundaries and the politics that prevent innovation because there's you know there's intellectual hoarding and so forth, which is the antithesis of the kind of real time sharing of information that you just demonstrated. Right. It's oh, kind oh, of extraordinary. Oh, Organizational readiness for change uh, is what the number one barrier, along with achievement of business case, for getting things done in um, most of the client organizations I've worked with. I, I was referring you earlier to uh, a time when I was in business process uh, evolution and support, and we were, we were applying change in 100 operating companies at once for a global manufacturer of consumer goods. and. Uh, it's okay for center to decide something, but for 102 operating countries to adopt it, often you know, changing things that have grown up as custom and practice in that country with all of the politics of a global world and the fiefdoms that exist. Yeah. The actual technology is arguably the easier bit, but the adoption of the business readiness and then the uh, operational control and control framework for that are, are the real challenge, which is what makes global transformational change much harder than simply deployment. As we, um, as we talk about different lines of business and one, one certain function that's going through massive transformation, and I, I know this firsthand, is the marketing function within the enterprise. Yeah, this guy, this guy is a CMO. <laughs> So, uh, so let's you know. Feel free to so, uh, poke at him. No, please, no. <laughs> there's no way. I, oh, oh, that's both, right. That's counter both, to what we're talking both about. Andy Sorry. And Frank have demonstrated in half hour how collaborative they are. So I'm fairly <laughs> certain I'm not going to get poked from our, our, our CIO guest today. But Accenture just did a research study in terms of defining or uh, best practice relationship between CIOs and CMOs. I'm certainly interested, Andrew, in your new role. Uh, how how closely do you work with the CMO at Accenture? 
and uh, based on your research and clients, um, is there tension between CIOs and CMOs? We keep reading, in fact, today in CIO magazine, there was an article in the news, will the CIO ultimately report to the CMO? Um, so talk to us a little bit about your, both of your relationships with marketing at Accenture. From my perspective, the CIO works for the entire business. and It will never be a case that the CIO uh, works for one function. I think that would be a massively retrograde step because finance and business development and, and other functions you know, have huge responsibilities in any enterprise, any agile enterprise in the future. But I think any CIO that thought that the CMO uh, interlock and liaison wasn't anything other than mission critical would be not in role that long, particularly, particularly in the digital age of today. We do work extremely closely. Uh, and actually, it's, it's the, the marketing function that represents some of the most adoptive of our user base and demanding of our user base, because there, there's a combination of creativity in a technology world, in a technology organization. And so it's, it's unsurprising that uh, a lot of the, the marketing-based events, et cetera, are, are some of our biggest users and our most stressed users in terms of the technology we provide. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I would say over the years, they've actually been very demanding, very articulate about their demands, and incredibly fact-based about what they need. They're very analytical, and the technology just fulfills the analytic side of it. So I think there's been a really wonderful move in, in marketing over the years. We have a great pairing relationship, but I think it, what Andrew said is also correct. We serve everyone. Who, who owns the web uh, at Accenture? Is it IT? Is it marketing? Is it a collaborative uh, committee? Uh, and I ask specifically about the web because according to Gartner, CMO of uh, you know 1,700 CMOs, uh, the web, the corporate web, is, is the number one spend in terms of digital priority. So I'm wondering, do you agree that the web and the user experience is, is really driving the tech spend in marketing? And is it, at Accenture, your own website, is, is it something that IT owns or marketing or, or a cross-functional group? Andrew, you want me to take that or you want to take that one? By all means, sir, by all means. Well, basically, we own the technology. We build it working with them. Okay. They put the content out there. They're responsible for the content. We're responsible for the technology. But it's a collaborative undertaking. And okay. by the way, one of the things we've learned is they set the bar very high. Mm. And in fact, Andrew, one thing I was reflecting on, we, we believe that the world, Andrew and I have been talking a lot about how everything has to be always on. You know who asked for always on before everyone else? Marketing. Sure. Interestingly enough, they saw the future before we saw it in some regard. So, you know, I, I think, you know, you've got to have that give and take to really have the successful outcome. We build the technology, but it's working very closely with them. Great answer. As we start to wind down the show, which I hate to do because this has been an incredible, incredible. discussion, uh, can you... Give us a sense of, let's, let's maybe offer advice for CIOs whose organizations are not, how do I say it, not quite as innovative as Accenture's. Maybe IT is less of a focus. So for, for those organizations, what can the CIO do to gain a better understanding of the business and at the same time help ensure that the business has a greater appreciation for the transformation potential of IT in driving business improvement? Any CIO needs to understand fundamentally the business that it is serving. And so it's unsurprising that if I'm a business leader who has now stepped into CIO, because as we've said earlier in this broadcast, you know, every business is a digital business. And the CI know needs to make that so and make it clear to his executive colleagues the value and the benefit that it can bring and how mission critical it is and how absolutely vital it is for them to stay in business. So the order taker, back office, cost center, I'll just make sure that email and all that is on, it, it is, is long, long gone. So a CIO for today and a CIO for tomorrow is an internal consultant. It's an, it's an orchestrator of the various 
technologies that don't always integrate. It's a, it's a coach, it's a consultant bringing innovation and ideas to a business saying, do you realize you can do this? Do you realize you should do this? But do it in this order and don't do this because of this pitfall. And I can say that because I'm one of you, but at the same time I have an understanding of what the technology ecosystem can now deliver. So how about trying this? Technology will glue businesses together more and more fundamentally in the future. And that places the CIO in a hugely powerful and influential role. The question is, does the DNA pool that has grown up to become today's generation of CIO, do they adapt to that? Can they navigate that world? Can they adapt to the social enterprise? And I suspect in five years time, we'll be reading books about the success traits of those who did and those who didn't. And Frank, any thoughts? Uh, you've been CIO at Accenture now for 11 years as you leave that role. Any thoughts uh, on advice that you can offer CIOs who want to emulate the experience that we've been discussing today? Well, I think the points that Andrew just made are spot on. If you think about it, the world is constantly changing. You have to change with it. You have to embrace the change. I think we all know the individual who doesn't have a cell phone or doesn't have, you know, streaming on demand or doesn't, you know, didn't move forward with technology. But these are exceptions. The same thing is happening in business. Can you imagine a business today that doesn't have a website? There's, they're, they're out there. But if you're not becoming more and more digital, someone's going to come by and the digital technology, the software, some way, somehow is going to eat you up. You've got to keep moving. That's the beauty of technology. It keeps getting better, so we can keep doing more things with it and automating things and taking friction out of business. When you think about your own experience as a customer of a business, friction is a pain in the neck. No one likes it. Remember that your customers don't like it. Think about your end customers. Think about your people, your employees. The world's changing. It changes very quickly, and I think right now we are on the premises of a new wave of technology that will revolutionize the enterprise. The last 10 years were more consumer centric. The 10 years before that were more enterprise centric. I think we're on this wave. We've, we've talked about some of them today, the whole smack, right? It's all coming together. We're probably only a year or two into it. The landscape's going to look completely different in 10 years. No question about it. Embrace the change. It's going to be a wonderful ride. Well, this has been an extraordinary conversation. That was the fastest 50 minutes I, know. I think we've had in our show. You know, the thing that struck me maybe the most is when we were talking about gamification and training, and you talk about real-time information flow. Absolutely. And what yeah. I love is that the employees of Accenture feel they're empowered enough to send their, you know, their understanding of the business to the two top executives that are running technology at a 275,000 organization. And basically say, hey, guys, make here's sure. what it is. Here's, here's what, here's what here's we're what doing. Right, right. That's extraordinary. That's, that, that truly is. Well, this has been a, another fantastic show, Vala, as always. Thank you very much. And I'd also like to thank SAP for sponsoring this episode. And Frank and Andrew, you were brilliant. Thank you very much for joining us. Yes, thank you. We've, we've been talking with. Andrew Wilson, who is the present CIO of Accenture, and Frank Monderson, who is the retiring CIO of Accenture, who's been there for 11 years. And gentlemen, we can't thank you enough for joining us and spending the time today. It's been a wonderful discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much, guys. Take care. And everybody who's been watching, I hope you will tune again next time, and we're going to have another great show. Thank you very much, and have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye. <laughs>